It's mainly the fact that because Elizabethan England is a Protestant country, its main enemy at that time is the Catholic world. It's Spain and it's Italy. Um, and so when Queen Elizabeth is looking for an ally, she actually turns to the Islamic world because the Islamic world, of course, is also locked in a struggle with Catholicism. So in the 1560s and 1570s, Elizabeth starts writing to the Ottoman sultans. So she's writing very, very uh, friendly letters, trying to encourage trade between England and the Ottomans. But she also knows that that's going to be militarily quite helpful because the Ottomans are really at war with Spain in particular. So there's also a way in which the two cultures claim that there's a religious connection between each other because the Protestants say we're not idolaters, we believe in the word of the book and Islam is the same. So there's a weird moment, very strange moment that people usually forget about where Protestant Christianity and Muslim Ottoman empires actually come together and that starts to influence Shakespeare's drama. The specific contacts are really around trade and merchants. So English merchants are operating in Morocco uh, from the 1550s and they're actually selling arms to the Moroccan sultans and they're selling arms in exchange for sugar and that's very interesting because one of the famous stories about Queen Elizabeth is that she has very black teeth because she has too much sugar. Now what people forget is that the sugar comes from Morocco and it comes from a very specific contact with the Islamic world because again the English merchants say we're Protestants, you're Muslims, we're all against the Spanish, let's do deals together. So that's one specific uh, point of contact. The other is uh, with the Ottoman Empire. So from the 1570s there are English men who are trading uh, with Istanbul um, and by the early 1580s there is a resident English ambassador, a guy called William Harborn, who's living in Istanbul working with the Ottomans around trade but also diplomatically as well. Those are the two main ones but there are also many other links. So the English are reaching Persia in the early 1560s and they're dealing with the Persian uh, Shah, the early Shahs who are interestingly Shia Muslims. So they're working with Sunni Muslims in Morocco, Sunni Muslims in the Ottoman Empire, and then Shia Muslims in Persia. And they understand, they have a grasp of those religious differences, which are probably as complicated as they are today. So we shouldn't imagine that there's not an understanding of those differences in religion between Protestantism, Catholicism, Sunni, Shia, and different varieties of Islamic faith. Shakespeare talks a lot about Moors in his plays and Moors are really from North Africa, from the area that we would now call Morocco, um, the area that Shakespeare also calls Barbary, the Barbary Moor. And one of his earliest plays, Titus Andronicus, which is the early 1590s, has a place as a play. As a, it's a play. I'll do that again. In one of Shakespeare's earliest plays, called Titus Andronicus, dated into the early 1590s, one of the key characters is a figure called Aaron, Aaron the Moor, and he is clearly an agent of evil. He's a black figure who's very blasphemous, and he's seen as the absolutely archetypal figure of, as it were, the evil Muslim. But then within a couple of years, Shakespeare writes another play called Merchant of Venice. Now we usually think of Merchant of Venice as a play which is only really about Jewishness and Shylock as the Jewish moneylender. But what's interesting is that the play also has the Prince of Morocco in it. So one of Portia's suitors is the Prince of Morocco. And he is actually shown as a very noble figure. So Shakespeare has got the very evil figure of the Muslim Moor with Aaron and then he writes the figure of the very noble, uh, rather, rather sort of attractive uh, Moroccan Moor who's the Prince of Morocco. 
then around 1600, he almost brings those two characters together and he writes a play called Othello. And Othello is the more of Venice. And of course, what Othello is, is really a bit of both. Othello is both the loyal Venetian subject and the wonderful husband and the murdering figure and the great blasphemer. He's, he's all of those things at the same time. And I think that what Shakespeare is doing is he's drawing on all that history and all those exchanges with the Islamic Empire. And he's tried a version with Titus Andronicus. He's tried another version with Merchant of Venice. And Othello brings them all together. And it's a unification of all those ideas. It, it's, it's much more complicated. It's not simply, we used to think that this period just hated Islam and thought Muslims were just awful. That's not true. Neither is it true that Elizabethan England loved Muslims and thought that they were wonderful. It's about moving between those two things. And it's about the fact that they're trying to survive by working with the Muslims. He's reading books which of course are being printed around this time about Africa, about the Ottoman Empire. All of his dramatic contemporaries are doing plays about Turks, Moors and Persians. Throughout the 1590s when Shakespeare is most active, everybody's writing plays about Muslims. It's a huge, it's a, it's a massive rage. Shakespeare actually follows fashion. He doesn't set fashion by having Moors and Turks. He's always, he's looking at what Mar Christopher Marlowe's doing this, Peel, Johnson, Middleton, they're all producing Muslim figures. So they're all over the stage, but he's also reading historical books about the Muslims, and he's also encountering merchants who are coming back from Morocco, are living in the areas where Shakespeare is, and he, they're saying to him, oh, we've just come back from Marrakesh, and this happened. And there are others saying, we've just come back from Istanbul, and we've brought these amazing things, and we met these extraordinary people. And some will say, and these people were terrible infidels and they were awful, irreligious Muslims. And other people would probably say, I quite got on with them. You know, we got on, we, we traded with them. So it gives you a very, very, uh, uh, a much more complex picture of those relations, just as they are now. So for me, it's, for me, it's very important to say, this is also what's happening now. But it's both because if you're a dramatist, you're interested in things which are, are never quite sure. You're interested in conflict. That's what you want to put on stage. You don't want to put a black and a white character and keep them black and white. You want them to be much more complex than that because that makes for better drama. And I think Shakespeare is taking Muslim characters and saying, these figures are really interesting. They're both despised and hated, but also loved and admired. They're militarily very powerful. They come with all this beautiful, opulent, orientalist dress. They look fantastic, but they might also be stealing our women. You know, there's an element of that in Othello. So he's playing on the fact that they're interesting characters to put on a stage. Historians don't like those kind of figures who are too complicated. Dramatists do. They want to put them on stage and see what happens. And I think that's what Shakespeare and all his contemporaries who are writing drama are interested in. A lot of the earlier work that I did before doing Shakespeare in Islam was to look at the broader Renaissance world and say that actually there are a lot of exchanges between the Italian city-states, including Mantova, in the late 15th and early 16th century, um, that they're working a lot with the Ottoman Empire. So actually, I think there's a lot of exchanges going on. We're just not told about them. So the Gonzaga um, are trading horses very openly and very in very friendly ways with the Ottomans um, from the 1490s. And all the letters are there. The, the Gonzaga have specific Turkish translators in, how, in, 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 the, in the palace so they can write to the uh, sultans and they can exchange horses with them because they, of course, want Arabian thoroughbred horses. 
Um, there are exchanges of silk, of tapestries, of all kinds of sort of lavish objects. And alongside that, the Gonzaga and the Medici are saying, oh, these terrible Muslims, but they're actually doing business with them at the same time. And it's just like, yeah, it's never changed in that way. So we shouldn't think that there's some purity of Christian Western Renaissance belief that always says, oh, those terrible Muslims. I don't believe that at all. And if you think that that's happening in the earlier 16th century, it's no surprise that in the later 16th and early 17th century, the English are much more open about doing business with the Islamic world.